Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories here in the world of physical therapy. I'm Drew McKay. I'm your host tonight, broadcasting live from the Arius Medical Studios. Uh, find them online at aureusmedical.com. Leaders and hashtag travel physical therapy. Let your PT or PTA license take you where you want to go. Uh, positions in all settings in all 50 states. Just check the website, see what's available. You're essential. Go do that essential thing where it's needed. That's what essential means. Uh, A-U-R-E-U-S-Medical.com. That is the website. Go visit there. Uh, great show for you tonight. We're going to talk about esports. We did an episode on this. It was frightening. I just I looked back. It was like two years ago. We should have done something in between there, but I'm glad we've got a returning guest back on the show today. So esports, we're going to dig into it. Maybe you've just heard the term or seen a hashtag. Maybe you saw the recent article in APTA's magazine. Yes, bringing about some good light. It was the cover article. It's a big step for our profession and esports and the athletes it supports. So we're going to dig into that tonight. Uh, some physics of the show. We are recording this live via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're watching there, say hi. Drop in the comments below live and where you are. Let us know where you're geographically watching the show from. We're always you know, concerned about where, the, uh, where you guys are. Let us know questions or comments. This isn't one of those things where we're like, ah, save the questions and comments for the end. No, feel free. Ask away. Drop those in the comments below. If you're watching the replay or listening to the podcast, make sure you jump over to the socials at PT Pinecast. Feel free to drop a uh, the word replay and where you are if you have any questions or comments. We love to follow up with those as well, too. Or you could even text or call me during the show. I bet you you won't. I bet you you won't. But that's my phone number on the screen. That's how much I bet you won't. So feel free to uh, to drop us a line. Uh, a text is good because right now I got headphones on. I'm busy. Good. All right. Uh, let's get the show going right now. Where's the Where's the audience? There we go. Let's bring our guests in the studio right now. Physical therapists who work with esports athletes. Let's bring in Caitlin McGee, Elliot Smithson, and Matthew Hill. Welcome to the show. <sighs> hey, Jimmy. Lady and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the program. Caitlin, welcome back, first of all. Has it really been two years? Yeah, it's been two years. We did an episode live, like literally, I mean, on the street corner, right? Because yep. we were like, we were at a at a bar. We were at World bar. of Beers in Arlington, and we had yep. just done a live show. We're about to do a live show. You just uh, finished a live show with Marymount, uh, Marymount yeah. Uh, Eric Mara and Adam Meekins were uh, were doing like their shoulder course for the weekend, so we decided to uh, to to get together. Uh, first question for Matthew, Elliot, Caitlin. You already know the first question. It's always the hardest. What are we drinking tonight? Oh, Elliot, you can start. All right, all right. We got we got Coke Zero right. and Jack. Coke this Zero. Zero. Oh. That is a very. I feel like that's a very gamer drink right there. Bold because you've got. Yeah. You have to pick me up, and you've got to pull me off. So I like that. No sugar, so no it's sugar. perfect. There you go. Matthew, what do you got? Are you guys ready? Yes. Wow. Wow. Classy. It is faithful. Classy. Classy. Bud Light Very classy, Matt. Done. It's not physical therapists do it. Like yeah, it. And, and I, just like Matt, have some water. Exactly. Great. Burn. It looks like I have water, but I assure you this is this is vodka cup soda. So Ooh, cheers to that you. That sounds delicious. Wow. It's, it's pretty well, good. I should have poured a glass of wine, maybe. We'll start here. We're not all that classy. You know, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the first round brought to you by our friends at Owens Recovery Science, a single source for PTs looking for certification and personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training and the equipment you need to apply it properly. In your clinical practice, find them online at OwensRecoveryScience.com. Uh, Johnny Owens, just part of that uh, ESPN documentary, uh, Project 11, with Alex Smith, who returned from a gruesome leg injury. And uh, he's back on the field using BFR, part, part of, not you know the only part of his recovery, but that was part of his recovery. So check it out online at OwensRecoveryScience.com. This question is already out of the way, guys. That was it. What are you drinking? So we're done there. Um, but let's go macro to micro. Caitlin, I know we asked the first time and for people who heard two years ago, but I feel like they need a refresher because probably a lot's changed. Um, when someone says, like, what do you do? And you say esports, physical therapy. First of all, they're like, they might not even be sure of that first term, esports. So I'm sure this comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. What the heck is it? 
So there's actually a whole bunch of debate around the term esports in the first place. Um, there's folks who think that we shouldn't have called ourselves anything related to sports in the first place. Um, there's folks who don't particularly care either way. Um, and there's folks who really intentionally chose the name because it does relate back to um, sports, which is, you know, what people think of as competitive things, right? Um, esports broadly is any competitive scene of a video game. Um, so that can be played on a console like an Xbox or, or a PlayStation. It can be played on PC. It can be played on mobile, although that may be a mildly controversial statement in esports circles. Um, there's there's definitely kind of amongst the more mainstream, less familiar with esports folks, some degree of contention about, you know, like, can you really say you're treating esports athletes if what they're doing is sitting at a computer and playing a game? Uh, there's always, inevitably, anytime there's anything esports related shown on ESPN, there are always very angry people on Twitter who are like, this isn't sports. Why is it on ESPN? This isn't, you know, who, who's claiming that this game is a sport and really whether or not esports is sports and whether or not esports competitors are athletes or not really feels like a red herring to me um, because okay. it's a specific subset population that has specific performance needs that we as physical therapists and as part of a larger larger medical profession can help address. Well, I feel like two years ago when we were having our first conversation about esports, I think Keith Oberman had just made a comment like that yep. week before, right? I and he was, about it, I think. Like trash talking like this isn't sports. And like, I don't know if this makes, this should make you feel better, right? Because like you said, we can go around and around. It's like a red herring mm -hmm. Put it however you want. I mean, there's discussions whether or not golf is a sport. Well, that's yeah. a game. It's not a sport. I was like, have you ever hit a golf ball? It's like, yeah. I mean, the average person off the street can hit the golf ball, but can you do what these guys can do? It these right. women and men can do at a high level. Yeah, that's exactly. a skill. And then you add, you multiply. The, Same you, with like NASCAR. Right. Uh, right. Like it's yeah, sure. I you know it's it, we all joke that it's drive fast, turn left. Um, but we also recognize that there are, like, there's, there's reaction time involved. There is some upper body strength involved when you're going at that fast of a speed. There's some endurance involved in being able to maintain posture for that period of time. Um, and so all of those things to me make it irrelevant whether or not you're going to call somebody's specific activity a sport or not. Um, and I think getting into the weeds on that just, um, right. misses the entire point of this is a specific performance need. Let's address that regardless of whether or not you think it's actually a sport. Right, right, right. When someone starts down that path, it's almost like, listen, you're either going to agree or disagree. That's not, that's your decision, but I'm not here to have the argument that you want to have. Right. right. I got a buddy who works on uh, an Indy car driver, uh, and that's like the open, you know, the open top, you know, sports cars. And he's like, listen, I work a ton of neck, neck muscles on this guy. He's yep. also driving, you know, 500 miles. So you mentioned endurance. So we we can get into weeds about what's a sport or not. We're not. We're having an episode. Let's listen. It's in the title of the episode, which must mean it's real. It's real. Exactly. <laughs> it's written down on the internet. That means it's true. On the I internet. think all one person needs to see is probably the World Cup championship. Uh, Booga, the 16 year old kid that won, just watch his keyboard camera. And that's all you have to do. Just show them the keyboard camera, and you'll see why there is a lot of physical stress um, associated with just the left hand. So let's we're bringing this up on the screen. If you're watching this online and we're scrolling through, we make that go full screen. Is that real speed? That's not sped up. That's real speed. Yeah, it's real speed. And look, so look at his index finger. And it's interesting, right? Because look there's that, lines. Right. Yeah, there's a lot. It's what? crazy how many you, you can specify certain keys on the keyboard to do certain things. Right. And him, this guy, every one of his binds is controlled by the index finger. Every single bind? one. Uh, so a bind, it means in this game, you build different um, structures. There's ramps, there's walls, there's floors, and there's what we call a pyramid or a cone. And you can bind a specific key to a button. And he's so he, all just ridiculously fast. Yep. Exactly. All with his index finger. So can you imagine? And this is all the APMs on this. And APMs, for those that don't know, are actions per minute. Are pretty insane. It's a uh, it's a pretty ridiculous amount, and with each month, these skills just exponentially increase. Because guess what, the kids just have so much time to yeah. dedicate to improving the mechanical skill uh, relating to gaming. So I mean, even that's all you need to see. Skill too, if you're like if you're looking at what's happening on the screen, you can see how fast he's processing, reacting, um, and creating things on screen. Like that is a significant amount of cognitive strain as well. And so, yeah, it might not be, uh, there's not going to be the the kinds of explosive forces required that you might see in football, 
But are you really going to look at that and tell me that it doesn't require really quick reaction time, really fast processing, and significantly fast movement speeds, at least in the wrists and fingers? So Matthew, it's, it's easy to keep this up for a good two to three minutes, all busy, but when right? you're doing this for seven to eight hours in a day, just queuing back-to-back -back games, this really adds up over time. And yeah. the amount of endurance required to actually pull this off is incredible. Yeah. Matthew, you mentioned APM. Like, like what's, a, what's a number, like what's an average number and what's someone like this guy doing? Like acting per minute. So actually, I, I made a video about this, um, exploring the the different amount of actions per minute of the of the pros in the space. And what I did was I tried to calculate based on these camera views uh, the rough amount of actions per second, and then I extended it to minutes. It gets roughly between uh, at the top level probably one fifty to two hundred actions per minute, um, which is insane, right? So I mean, how do, how many is that per? Per second, probably two to three actions per second that they're doing. And these Can are you imagine that like, these are like these are these are accomplishing something. You know what I mean? They're not just yeah. just jamming yeah. on. You know, they're, right? They're, this is not just like button mashing. This is their intentional a ramp. He built a yeah. roof. He's built a ramp. Yeah. Wow. And they all have intentions. Yeah. All right. And they're all playing off positions. Sorry. Go on. We just mentioned <laughs> positions and actions and rep, 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 uh, repetitive and endurance. This sounds like a lot of physical therapy terms or, or terms that we, we 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 refer to in physical therapy. So we'll go back to to Kaylin. Like, how is this similar and different from? I don't. Do we want to call it traditional sports physical therapy? Because I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's it's probably the easiest distinction that we use. Like, is referring to traditional sports PT versus esports PT. Um, so there's there's quite a bit in common, and there's quite a bit that's different. So let's start on the stuff that's in common first. First one that's really most in common is really stubborn, very competitive individuals at the top of their game who don't necessarily want to listen to somebody else telling them yeah, what to do. That's pretty <laughs> typical, yeah. That's, that's pretty universal. Um, there's a bit more of a hurdle to face in esports, at least, because, you know, if you grow up playing traditional sports, right? Like, I grew up playing soccer. I played soccer all through college. I played for my, my university. Um, you grow up with the expectation that you have to take care of your body in a particular way in order to perform at your best because you're coming up in this very organized sport structure, right? There's all this research and literature associated with it, which informs the opinions of the coaches, the trainers, the doctors who work with you, um, and, and kind of how the best way is to go about improving your performance. Esports is so new and so nascent and so not organized in the sense there aren't like intramural leagues broadly for, for esports, um, that a lot of people are, are basically getting to the top based off of whatever they figure out for themselves or whoever they emulate um, in the process of getting there. So there isn't this baked in expectation that, yeah, of course, in order to be at my best, I have to pay attention to my exercise and my, my posture and my ergonomics and my nutrition and hydration and sleep and my mindset. All of these things that we kind of take for granted being built into traditional sports infrastructure. Yeah. So I guess one of the biggest differences between the two is just the lack of infrastructure and the lack of expectation um, about the, the kinds of activities you'll be engaging in outside of just your game time, which on the one hand kind of sucks because it means that a lot of everything we do, we have to do a whole bunch of education first as to why it even matters. Um, it also is kind of tough because any really big efforts that take off are still kind of disparate. They're, they're very much individual team by individual team or individual player by individual player, as opposed to league wide uh, or game title wide. And so it does take time for that to spread, um, which is why we kind of work on both a top down and a bottom up approach, kind of educating both top tier pros and then working at the community where everybody's getting developed from in the first place. But at the same time, that lack of infrastructure is kind of useful in the sense that we don't have to necessarily go with the same models that sports has been using. And we're not bound to just what we know from, from traditional sports, right? We can absolutely draw from all that we've learned from traditional sports, especially when it comes to things like mindset, um, when it comes to competition, when it comes to performance in terms of um, training periodization. But we can also borrow from other fields that are also analogous to esports, right? We can look at something like um, how do we approach uh, cognitive uh, kind of strain in the fields of air traffic controllers, also sitting for long periods of time at a cognitively demanding task? How do we address things like sleep when there's such really different schedules because people are playing internationally yeah. from you know their own time zone? You know, let's look at how third shift workers, especially night nurses, adjust to those kinds of particular strains. 
let's look at the fact that a lot of esports pros in order to get paid also have to do live streaming they have to be entertainers as well as competitors so you know let's uh, let's have a look at how uh, performers musicians actors dancers even wwe professionals uh, how they approach performance and how do we apply that to esports and so there's all of these fields that we can draw from without being bound to traditional sports, which I think is one of the biggest pros of distinguishing esports from traditional sports and not trying to make the argument that, yeah, esports is like regular sports. It's just right. gaming online. I think that we should probably embrace the fact that we're different and should make use of all of the benefits that difference allows us to change. So you talked about top tier athletes and amateurs, you know, people like me who just want to want a game, want to, you know, want to want a game competitively. Right. Um, you threw some numbers at me the first time we spoke and I thought you misspoke. I thought you used the wrong letter, but in terms of scope and you don't have to give me an exact figure, but like esports as a, as a business, mm -hmm. like what are we talking about in terms of scale of money? Okay, so the answer to this one is a very PT answer of it depends. Right. Uh, <laughs> at the top tier, um, so let's take something like Dota 2, uh, which actually this this is mildly controversial in esports right now because uh, Dota 2 has a very top-heavy structure, specifically one tournament top-heavy structure where a large part of the prize pool is throughout the entire year is assigned to just this one tournament. It's kind of like the World Cup of Dota. Okay. Dota is a 5v5 capture a base kind of game. Um, the prize pool for next year's, if it actually happens, uh, international, which is the World Cup of Dota, uh, will be a total of $40 million. What? Winning team will take home over $15 million. What? Which, mm -hmm. by the way, is more than Excellent the uh, women's national, U.S. Women's National Team took home for winning any of their World Cups, just saying. Wow. So we're talking, like, in industry, we're talking... Yes. Industry-wide, we're talking massive amounts of money. But... It's pretty darn concentrated. Um, again, I mentioned, right, like there's not intramural leagues for esports the way that there are necessarily for football, little league, soccer, yeah. basketball. Um, all of these traditional sports have kind of these development structures. There aren't, you know, academy leagues as much. There are some teams that haven't have them, but not a lot. Right. And part of the reason for that is there's just not the money there to support them. And when I say there's not the money there, I don't mean that the money doesn't exist. I mean that the money has been assigned elsewhere. Um, right. It's been prioritized elsewhere. So right. yeah, there's absolutely um, folks who do not make a living in esports, or folks who struggle to make a living in esports, um, and there are absolutely folks who are competing. You know, at the level of of in terms of prestige and money made at the level of like an NFL athlete. Um, nobody's making multi million dollar per year contracts yet, but there are pros with multi million dollar multi year contracts. That's a thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we're talking about ways, ways to win. Number one, if you get enough eyeballs on something, there are people who want to advertise on that mm -hmm. and that they will draw the best players because the prize purse goes up and the, the it just right. goes around and around. But there's also a great way to spread it out in terms of um, making it a little bit more flat world. Right. And that's right. like having a Twitch account and Patreons and stuff like that. So talk about that for just a second. Like one sure. of you take that, like, how's that work? Why are people paying attention to someone else playing a video game? Um, for the same reason that somebody might pay attention to somebody else playing a soccer game. You might like watching the game and you might like watching somebody who's really fucking good at it. Do a good job. Sorry yeah. for the swearing. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, for the same reason that, you know, I'll watch, I don't know. I was going to say Liverpool. I can't bring myself to say Liverpool for the same reason that I'll watch Tottenham, you know, kick somebody's ass. Uh, right. I will absolutely watch, you know, somebody like ammunition or, Bugga or, you know, any of the pros that or professional really streamers because yeah. they're really good at it. Um, now, there is a bit of a difference between an esports professional in terms of like somebody who's signed and contracted to a team to compete at a professional level and a live streamer with a big degree of overlap, like Venn, di Venn diagram going on here. Mm -hmm. Professional players often have built into their contracts um, a mandate that they must stream a certain amount of hours per month. Just this get helps get money. eyes on their sponsor. Um, no, 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 no. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there are also people who are not professional competitive gamers who do not compete in, in anything other than kind of like show match type tournaments or, you know, fun community tournaments, um, whose primary occupation is live streaming themselves, playing video games, interacting with their community. Um, and those are very much about um, being an entertainer more so than just being really good at your game. They might be both. 
there are a lot of competitive um, professional players who also happen to be really good um, entertainers and draw in their communities well. Right. And there are a lot of folks who might retire from the stresses of competition and become a full-time streamer instead. That's absolutely happened more than once. Um, so there's some overlap there. Um, but for the most part, the the kinds of folks who go into you know the top tiers of competition um, in esports do it for the same reasons that people you know try and get into the NFL. They really love playing and they're really good at it. Yeah. A couple things. Number one, um, I feel like it, it, I don't know exactly where the line is in terms of generation, but I feel like my dad, if I was ever good enough to play professional video games and be an esports athlete, he'd be like, I don't understand why a bunch of people are going to sit around and watch you do this thing while my dad watches like a guy, another guy build a house on TV or someone else cook exactly. dinner. Look, I've now reached the point in my life where HGTV is entertaining to that right. point. <laughs> like, okay, so someone else doing something. Well, we can enjoy it. yeah, we, we as human right. beings like seeing somebody do something really well. Sure, we'd really love to do things well on our own, but there's also a degree of enjoyment in watching somebody who's really good at what they do do that's, the thing. That's how to get better at it, too, though, right? Yeah. There's yeah. got to be an element of that, which is like, oh, gee, I never thought about doing that that way. Right. Maybe if I can. The other thing is, if you draw a big enough audience, you don't necessarily need to be the best, right? So some of the live streams exactly. are entertainers. So you don't need to be the best physical therapist. You could just have a podcast that everybody listens to, and all of a sudden, people pay attention. Oh, shoot. Did we just Wait. Oh, oh, no. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> Can you bring about things that are entertaining, informative? And I tell people all the time in radio, right. my program director said TBI, not traumatic brain injury. It was tight, bright, and informative. Can mm -hmm. you get to the point? Can you make sure it, it feels fun? And can you teach me something like that's what you need to do? So yeah, every once in a while you throw in a, you know, a fart joke or something like that on the radio. Ha ha ha. It keeps me entertained. But like overall, are you an entertainer? Do you keep me entertained? It's like the different, right. we won't go down this rabbit hole, rabbit hole but the difference, difference between funny and fun. Like funny is hard to sustain. That's hard. Fun you can space out over time and you can you can you can really stretch that out. So all right, right. so now we've kind of set the stage in terms of esports and s traditional sports and, and where a physical therapist might come into this. Um, let's get a little more more narrow. Let's go to Elliot. Specific performance needs that are required for esports athletes. We we showed those APIs. So we've got a lot of, you know, fine motor skills, we got posture endurance. I'm guessing just from the surface that's what I see. There's a lot more there. What are we looking at? Yeah, for sure. I think that uh, that video of the APIs is a really good introduction to what we want to talk about next. Um, really, what you're seeing there is an application of mechanical skill. So very much like uh, performing arts or traditional sports, both of which I have a background in working in, kind of brought together to uh, develop my interest in esports medicine. Mechanical skill is really at the heart of any game. So whether or not you're using a mouse and keyboard as your input for uh, the game that you're playing or you're using a controller, um, it really breaks down to this concept of mechanical skill. And it's the same types of things that we see in traditional sports where jump shots are an example of mechanical skill, like layups are an example of mechanical skill, to use basketball as the example. So in esports, there are certain things relative to the game that you're doing that need to be there for you to be able to accelerate those to the highest levels. So for instance, in a shooting type video game, aim is gonna be your primary mechanical skill. And then as physical therapists, we've taken it upon ourselves to really kind of dive deep into that and really break down the motor coordination components of what make up those specific mechanical skills so we can really point pinpoint where in the, the player's game that they're having issues. Um, thing Games like uh, the tower defense games uh, or 5v5 uh, attack and defend type games that Kate was talking about earlier, they have a lot of uh, mechanical spell uh, skills that are based on spell casting and um, shooting spells in certain directions and kind of hitting the keys at the right time in order to get uh, last last shots on these uh, enemies that are running around and things like that. And they require a lot of precision and coordination and movement of the mouse and keyboard. Um, and you can you can find these pain patterns that are associated with the types of mechanical skills that they do based on their certain role in the game. So different uh, players will have different types of uh, classes that they play within these games, and depending on how they're moving their character or what the uh, actions that they're performing over and over again, we see that related with pain patterns. Um, so those are really what we... Uh, are trying to focus on as physical therapists and the performance considerations. Like you said, there's a lot going on with posture and endurance as well, um, especially in shooting games. Uh, we see a lot of um, issues where, uh, like I talked about before, mechanical skill of aim. Um, 
a lot of times in shooting games, they'll play with a really, really low sensitivity on their mouse and a really light mouse in order for them to be able to be as precise with their aiming as possible. So they're essentially moving their arm like this all day long, picking up a mouse that can be very heavy at times um, when you're picking it up 800 times over the span of a couple hours. Um, and that has uh, implications in the rotator cuff. Uh, we can see a lot of pathologies that develop there. And if they take it to the other extreme, so, so let's say that that mouse uh, now becomes heavier and they lower that sensitivity, um, then we see that force being translated to the wrist. So we see a lot more use at the wrist there. So asking these types of questions kinds of gives us a lot of information about where that player is and what type of uh, injuries that they may be susceptible to if they don't have injuries. And it kind of gives us a way to root out what um, types of factors may be causing the injuries that they are presenting with. Uh, just based understanding the uh, the nuance of their mechanical skill. So there's um, performance needs and the things. I mean, everything you're saying is 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 tied back to PT, right? Understanding what that that athlete is going through hundreds of thousands of times per week, per month, per year. Just adding on that, and then predicting. I mean, you just mentioned like two things with the mouse. I don't play PC games, but I never thought about it like that. Raising or lowering mm -hmm. the sensitivity might cause you to. You might prefer to use big giant motions, or you might prefer to use small wrist motions. Exactly. Depends on you, and both things are gonna are gonna appear differently for repeated or repeated movement injury. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just a matter of where that stress is being translated to. Absolutely, um, and kind of to mirror traditional sports, the other big uh, performance uh, category that we think about when we think about gamers is um, this concept of game sense. So not only do you have to have uh, the certain proficiency in performing the actions, you also have to understand your game to such a level where you're able to make these decisions at a really quick pace and be able to make them continually over time. And that goes, kind of plays into that cognitive fatigue element that Kate was talking about earlier. So really, when we think about uh, performance requirements, we're looking at mechanical skill and game sense. And yeah. then with that game sense, there's a lot of psychology considerations as well. I think a lot of athletes can relate to the experience of choking when a uh, professional athlete misses a shot or a yeah like a shot that they should have taken and had no problem doing in preseason over and over and over again. And when the big moment comes, it's just not there. We see that a lot in esports. I changed my class. That's what I do. When I, when I miss a shot in Call of Duty, I just change. I'm like, it's the gun's fault, dude. That's all. Yeah, I <laughs> absolutely. Or you can blame lag. That's always oh, a good you one. You can always exactly. blame lag. The dude is hacking, dude. He's, he's completely. Oh, yeah. That's that's the other one we see a lot. Did you guys see <laughs> um, Queen's Gambit? Yes. Oh, yeah. I actually wanted to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so, that, that made me think about this. A Queen's Gambit, great, like, little mini series on Netflix, like, really well done and then i found out at the end like kasparov like gary kasparov like like worked behind the scenes to make sure it was legit like chest sense but like I that have one was, small complaint about that show all right we'll get to it i'll let you complain i'll let you <laughs> but um, I, with that I, it reminded me of like a new york times article i read a while ago which talked about like the caloric demands yep. of chest yep. all day it's like they're not moving why are they burning all these calories? It's like, I don't know. Like maybe something in their body is eating a ton of calories and maybe it's their brain. We talk Brains about, are greedy. Brains are terribly greedy. So you're talking about like physical demands, but also like this is like chess with fine motor skills on the fly against another thinking human being. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of demand in there. All right. What's your beef about? It absolutely is. It? Okay. It happens in literally one scene, but they've got the board rotated 90 degrees and set up incorrectly. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna kind of she just really had to say that. I really did. Yeah. Just to clarify, you know? But no, yeah, like just, now that all this conversation is happening about chess, and when I was watching Queen's Gambit, I was like, wow, this is really the beginning of esports here. And mm -hmm. I think chess falls more in line with the, the types of esports that we see um, with like card games, um, even like the realm of professional poker comes into that. Um, but there's kind of a blend between uh, like a sliding scale, if you will, um, between what constitutes a strictly cognitive game versus a very intense um, game with musculoskeletal mechanical skills. Um, yeah. I think an example on either side would be chess versus a game like Beat Saber. I don't know if you guys have seen people wearing the VR headsets and they got the lightsabers and they're going wow. nuts, hitting all the little boxes and things. Um, but I think, right, yeah. that would be probably the most uh, extreme version of a game that requires mechanical skill to chess where there's virtually no mechanical skill. And that mechanical skill sliding scale is really where uh, we as PTs want to kind of be look on the lookout for games that have a potential for injury. 
Um, right. I think as we see more of these VR games become more popular and competitive, uh, we are gonna see more uh, traditional uh, type of injuries that we see more traumatic things as opposed to repetitive strain injuries that we see a lot in the the kind of PC gaming controller gaming world. You're going to see traumatic. I mean, how many videos I watch where someone's like, you know, it's always like, I feel like I don't want to be like ageist or anything, but it's always like someone's grandma, they put the VR goggles on her and then she tries to jump down a hole that isn't actually there and she jumps like off the sofa or something and you're like, hey, like you were in a game the whole time. Uh, we're talking about pain patterns. That word is, those words have come up. Uh, common injuries and pain patterns in esports. Matthew, what do you got on those? Like, what are what are what are we seeing? Uh, Elliot sort of alluded to some hand, some some shoulder wrist things, but what else? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the medium or what we call the peripheral that the gamers use. So everyone that's playing on the PC, they're going to be using the mouse and keyboard. But people that are playing on console, they're going to use a controller, and then. As Kay said, arguably for the mobile gamers, they're just going to be using their phone. Sometimes they can connect controllers and use a different medium. But depending on what medium they use, there's going to be different movement patterns. There's going to be different postures. There's going to be different ways that they grip the mouse, different ways that they grip their keyboard, position their hand on the keyboard. And that all has biomechanical consequences that lead to some of the common pain patterns that we see specifically for PC gamers. <laughs> It's mainly tendon injuries. So we actually see a lot of ECU tendinopathy. We see a lot of FDS, FTP tendinopathy. Um, and then for console gamers, we see actually variants of the quare veins and maybe thenar eminence overuse. We do see our occasional thoracic outlet uh, here and there, um, some other nerve irritation uh, syndromes. Um, but really, it, it depends, right? There's all these considerations that we have to take about how they're moving, how they're gripping the mouse, how is everything that Elliot mentioned in terms of sensitivity, the weight of the mouse, the shape of the mouse, how they're actually gripping, what's the friction of their mouse pad? Because some people prefer hard mouse pads, some per people prefer cloth mouse pads, and that influences the friction. And then what's their desk setup? How high is it? How's their chair relative to their desk? Does that and how does that create a different biomechanical load on the wrist? And how does that influence the position of the shoulder, their neck? And that leads to all these different pain patterns. Uh, specifically, all the repetitive strain issues that you know we see in the wrist and hand. And, and as I mentioned, ECU being a really prime one, especially in games that are first-person shooters. That's one of the ones that we've seen the most of. And it's so interesting, right? Because you just see how they hold the mouse. You just see how they play. And, and even what Elliot mentioned, there are specific skills in the game that you have to consider. Otherwise, you won't be able to identify why they've developed this issue in the first place. Let's say for a game like Super Smash Brothers, which is a console game, and they're controlling two characters fighting on a 2D platform or a 2D um, stage. There are really high level technical skills where they have to move the analog stick a lot with their thumb. And they also hold it in a weird and different way. They call it the claw grip. So they're gonna be using their pads and dabs a little more. And just by identifying that as well as, hey, they're pressing these two buttons very frequently because of this one skill in the game. Oh, and that doesn't even factor in the different type of character. Yep. Different characters have different movements and different movement patterns in the game that influence movement patterns outside the game. So there's all these considerations that we have to look into, understand, and then analyze so that we can say, hey, these are the actual physical, or this is where the actual load is going to, and this is what we can do to change that. We have to really have a bigger picture understanding of all of these different aspects so that we can better serve this population. Yeah, these are these are all PT terms, right? Um, when you when you mentioned, um, you know, in terms of the, the the monetary of the importance of these athletes on the highest end, right? Having one of these athletes out is a big deal. If it's a five v five sport, I mean, how many times do we like literally? If you're playing fantasy football, baseball, anything, you watch like the injury wire. Losing one of eleven guys on offense is a big deal. Losing yeah. one of five on a five v five sport is a big is a huge just 20 percent of your of your sport that's that's really really huge i mean that's got to come into consideration in terms of like why are now hopefully a high end of these esports and hopefully it's a trickle down method 
mm-hmm. paying attention to how can I play longer without injury? Um, how are you guys evaluating uh, the athletes you work? Is it is it? A, I mean, now it's a COVID, right? So everything's virtual and a half. These interviews are virtual, but mm-hmm. in terms of geography and and you know, in terms of scarcity, right? I mean, you and three PTs who come together to be one HP, right? Like esport physical therapists. Um, are you having them record themselves? Are you doing live sessions where you kind of zoom in or Skype in and watch them play? What are you doing to see these things? So we've been really fortunate in the past. Now it's five years, which is crazy to say, um, but we've been really fortunate to be and have access to a lot of the professional teams uh, playing across multiple esport titles. So playing League, playing CSGO, playing Overwatch, playing Call of Duty, playing Dota, all of these games where we've been fortunate enough to be contracted to actually help these athletes make sure that they we perform a comprehensive evaluation of their movement and identify, look at their posture, look at their ergonomics, look at what I include in my subjective evaluation, esports specific questions. What's your mouse? What's how heavy is it? What sensitivity are you using? What kind of grip are you using? We have to ask those specific questions and then understand, well, what character are you using? We have to, we've developed this framework of analyzing across these respective esports, the right questions to ask that give us better clues in our subjective eval so that we can inquire about the potential uh, tissue source and uh, obviously the contributing factors that might be leading to that. Yeah, um, it's so the equivalent of like having, you know, a football player in front of you who's got, you know, a, a knee injury. You might have them do some running and do a single leg squat and, you know, you, you might look at some of their more functional movements, right? These are the functional movements for, for esports players where we sure we need to ask them lots of questions. We mm-hmm. also need to see them move how they need to move in game. Um, and I think I think one of the really great things too that comes out of us asking these very specific, very kind of getting more and more to the heart of things type questions is it lets them know that we actually have some degree of understanding about what's going on and we're not just, you know, you hit buttons on a keyboard pretty right. fast, right? It's like, no, it's okay, what's your character mean? Okay, do you have a secondary? You know, what kind of grip do you have? Show me your controller, show me how you hold your controller. Um, okay, let's record you playing for a full 15 minutes so that you're not, you know, paying attention to it. And over time, we can see how your posture changes potentially. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's having that understanding going into it makes them more likely to give you the kinds of answers you need to actually get somewhere. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, most of the time they already have two thousand dollar streaming setup so getting footage <laughs> of them actually good. in their element is no, not, a, not problem. a problem it's yeah. not a problem for sure one of my one of my crowning moments as a pt student like made me feel great like oh i i actually have something i was working at an outpatient orthopedic clinic and the my ci was like hey the next patient in is uh like some athlete or something and i started asking he was a triathlete my my ci had no idea about triathlon and i was i was like okay well like what kind of bike are you riding and you know uh, what's your what's your swim stroke or like describe it. or did your coach change and my my ci was like how'd you know to ask that? i was like that's the world i live in i live in that yep. world i'm a triathlete exactly. like i was like i don't know where to I, I know what questions to ask oh my gosh i know something like that was the first exactly. one. I yeah. actually know something so asking all these questions um got to be vital right um, what equipment do you have? What, what games are you playing? What grip can you show it to me? Like mm-hmm. that differentiates that I, I, you know, I, I talk the talk, but I also walk the walk. I play these games. Yep. Yep. Yeah. At a pretty high level. At a pretty high level. All right. Yeah. So let's go back to Elliot. What's considered a good esport PT? I'm guessing. I mean, we just alluded to tip off, right? Knowing, knowing the games and respecting and being able to ask those questions and make sure that you're, you're, you're almost telling the patient something which is i understand a little bit about what you do please help me understand that more so i figure that's got to be in there right yeah no well i mean you have to love what you're doing obviously you're not going to work in the mlb if you don't love baseball um it's just not going to happen so that is step number one is you got to love gaming you got to be a gamer you got to be immersed in the culture um and then you have to demonstrate your knowledge in a way that makes sense for them a lot of times like i've worked like obviously it's impossible for us to be avid lovers of every single video game out there because there's so many titles like we have like a surface level understanding of a lot of them have played them to some degree but aren't fully invested in every single title out there 
But I found that that matters less and less as I've been doing evaluations for gamers across the spectrum of gaming. They don't necessarily need to know that you are top rank of whatever game it is that they're playing. They just want to know that you have some surface level understanding of it, understand the nuance of their peripherals, like what they're using, controller, mouse and keyboard, et cetera, uh, are able to hold a competent conversation regarding those things. Um, but you don't really need to have like the super highest level understanding of all the nuance of um, exactly what it takes uh, at the top levels to be successful from the game sense side of things. Um, most of the time they're really focused on their pain and that's something that we, we as PTs are really able to shine because we understand the anatomy. So getting into there, really taking the time to explain the anatomy to them. I use these visual body programs a lot of the times to really get in there, show them what muscles are causing their pain, give them an anatomy lesson. These are the nerves that run through these muscles. These are the muscles where you're having pain. And they're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That's exactly where I've been having the pain. It runs from here to here and it just has been bothering me and then you explain to them exactly what are the stresses that are related to their game that are causing this pain and then you kind of relate that all back into this big model of holistic health and how all of the other things that we love to talk about their ergonomic setup uh mental nutrition all of these other things relate Retraining, to that he breaks all those things yep yep, yep. and that's really like after you've hooked them with under showing them that you understand exactly the injury they're more willing to start incorporating these other things that we yep. uh like to preach about into their schedule yep. so yep. it really is building rapport um and just showing that you care man like that's really the heart of pt is just having a conversation with a person a lot of times pts get so hung up on the details of everything and it's really just can you have a conversation with this person and really connect with them and yeah. i think uh that's really easy to do if you just listen to what they're saying that listening yep. part it's not always easy right I and mean, there's that that often cited study which i don't even know what the hell it is anymore but it's like most of the time patients are interrupted in less than a minute right and, and we're talking in seconds but if you do a bunch of 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 listening, I mean, man, that person's probably waited weeks to get in front of you, and you're going to interrupt them in less than a minute. Man, that says a lot. Says a lot about you, and not a lot about them. Yeah. Um, coming back to Kate, PTs. What can PTs do to best support the industry of esports and esports athletes? Keeping the athletes playing, obviously one one of those things, and giving back, right? I mean, that this is the the greatest example of like like a jab, 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 right hook, which is just give, 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 like. Data, you know, brochures, PDFs, information, videos, which I'm, which you guys do already. But what else? What else can PT do to support this industry to keep athletes on the on the game on the on, on the field? So one of the things that I mentioned um, about kind of why sports infrastructure has developed to the extent that it has is that there's a whole bunch of research that's been done on athletes across a variety of of sports, right? We need more research on esports competitors. And sure, we need more research on, you know, non-competitive gamers as well and the injuries that they face. But if we want to be able to talk about the specific population of competitive gamers, we need to do research on the specific population of competitive yeah. gamers. Um, the, the data becomes more useful when it's more specific, at least in this particular case. Right. Um, any and all research at this point is is valuable and welcome and necessary. Uh, that's one of the best things that you can do if you are even if you're not directly interested in working with esports competitors. Like, if you have any interest in cool biomechanics stuff or you know really interesting ways of tracking how people move and how they play, uh, that's absolutely something you could potentially be interested in. Um, if you want to be well prepared to work with these patients potentially. Um, having some involvement of gaming of your own. Um, so finding games that you enjoy playing and don't just play the game, find the community around the game and get to know them, get to know right. what their needs are, right? Because the, I mean, the way that I got into esports was uh, I was working at tournaments doing in-game statistics for Dota 2. I'd had nothing to do with PT whatsoever. I saw that there was a need about ergonomics. I'd ask people questions about, you know, what was going on and how they felt about those things. And I came up with a couple ergonomics guide and I published them and I shared them. Um, no, 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 no. Why? <laughs> why? why? Because, because my friends got tired of me complaining about the terrible ergonomics and told me either stop complaining or do something about it. Right. Uh, before we started recording, I said, I've interviewed somebody <laughs> who had a similar, it feels like a similar tr story or tr career trajectory to yours uh -huh. on the show. Did you, do you have a guess on who it is? I have no idea who it is. She's a physical therapist. She is in professional sports. Stefania uh, Bell. Stefania Bell. Yeah. She started in like, um, 
like fan, like that, that fantasy roto sports rotisserie football like guys would have to get together in the room and do drafts and they used to tabulate they used to tabulate like points like manually like one dude was in there with a slide rule i don't even know what a slide rule is bunch of nerds right bunch <laughs> of nerds. but she was in there and she was super interested in interested in football and mm-hmm. she was a girl so people were like what do you know and she's like well i can tell you why that running back isn't going to have many points in the second half of the season because of the type of injuries i like Hold on a second. Why do you? How do you know that? She's like, well, I'm a PT, and they were like, hang on a second, let's bring the girl back around. She's like, oh no, no, no. But she became kind of like similar. You started writing like a column, right? Yeah. She I started doing something very similar in her story, which is like, all right, well now, I, oh now I know something. Oh, what do we got here? And she started sharing it, and you did that too. So I feel like they're you know similar, not the same, but very like you know in terms of like. I see something that you don't see and now I will share that with you. And now it is valuable because it is scarce. Yeah. It was very much, it was see a need, fill a need. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how Matt got into it too, that, you know, there was a need and he could fill it. And he was like, this is super cool and super interesting. And Matt, I won't steal your story too much. Um, although I do have to mention briefly how uh, you and I met slash didn't meet for a while, which was, uh, so I'd started working in esports. I'd gone to and worked at a couple tournaments and a whole bunch of the tournaments that I'd worked at were uh, Super Smash Brothers. Uh, so like, you know, Mario, Luigi, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it actually has a super robust competitive scene. It's really grassroots, but it's really solid. Um, especially now that there's actually online net play, all hail. Um, yep, all hail Slippy. <laughs> Bow down. Uh, Slippy developed an, a, basically a way to actually do online net play without massive amounts of lag. Um, so you can now play Super Smash Brothers online competitively against other real people without dealing with massive amounts of, you know, you can't right. possibly that's play like milliseconds, right? right. The you old know? Super Smash Brothers, the one that's not yeah, like, like the, for you know, the like, next the generation. One. One. Not the one that's on Switch, the old, yeah. old one. On yeah. GameCube. Um, but I worked a whole bunch of tournaments, um, worked with a bunch of people. One of the people I worked with was a, it's a guy named Kevin. Uh, his tag is Pew Pew U. And Kevin was like, oh yeah, my team, Cloud9, um, they're not CLG. Kind of, CLG. CLG. Yeah. My team, CLG, we have this PT that we work with. He's really great, you should meet him. I was like, yeah, give me his information. I'd love to meet him. I, like, I, I'm the only PT I know of in esports. I want to know more PTs in esports. Um, and then he forgot for like three tournaments straight to give me Matt's information, <laughs> despite <laughs> the fact that I would remind him before tournaments to bring me Matt's information. And then finally, Matt like randomly found me on Twitter. Uh, Twitter brings all together. Right? <laughs> exactly. That's how, Kaylin, that's how we, we found each other. That's I really, how we found each other, yeah. You were actually physically down the road from me in Arlington. Yeah, and I work with two of your members of your graduating class at right. Virginia Hospital Center when I used to work there. Right. That was yeah. the first piece of advice that I got when trying to get into esports PT. I get didn't have a Twitter. Twitter and I was sitting at a round yep. table at our steakhouse and with a bunch of pros and they were all like, yo, so are you on Twitter? And I was like, no, should I be? And they're like, you're not going to do anything yes. in esports if you're not on Twitter. You're and not going like, to do anything right. in esports if you're not on exactly. Twitter. All right, so let's do origin story. Caitlin, we just heard kind of yours mm-hmm. a little bit. Matthew, what do you what do you got in terms of like you've been doing you guys have all been doing this for what a roughly around five years longer, something something around there? Like, but so this was pretty new then. How did you uh, how did you come to this? Because if if you I mean, you know, my origin story is similar where a bunch of people I said, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have a podcast, and that's gonna be my gig. And people are like, You can't. It's not a thing. No one's done it. And you guys have all said screw that i'm gonna do it anyway so matt we'll go with you and then we'll come to elliot like origin story how'd you get into it so first off i'm a huge gamer so i've been playing games since you know the ocarina of time since the og super super mario brothers and the og smash brothers and i am pretty competitive i actually played competitively in some of the first competitive games cs 1.6 but that's sort of the basis of the story. After I graduated from PT school, I was working in an orthopedic clinic. And then I knew I wanted to do something outside of just working in the clinic. So I actually got into working in CrossFit communities to see if I can create a comprehensive injury prevention and management program for those athletes at the time because, hey, it was pretty big. And I realized that every day after work, I was coming home. I was hopping on the computer and playing competitive Counter-Strike with my friends. And I was the in-game leader. I was running the team. And really at that point, I I realized, wow, I can combine these two passions. I can combine my passion for gaming and I can combine my passion for physical therapy and helping people move better and start creating content. And from there, it really snowballed. I went to a bunch of events and... One of the only people that listened to me was the owner of CLG, um, Hotshot or George or Jalidus. 
and they were actually looking for a personal trainer at the time. And I said, wait, 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 I'm a physical therapist. I'm also a strength and conditioning coach. So I can do a lot more and help you guys create this holistic and comprehensive program to support your athletes, make sure they can play more and hurt less. And then from there, it really just spiraled into creating all this content, working with other teams, consulting for other teams. Um, and dots. it's been amazing. It's been fun. Connecting two dots. Like, yep. what is your biggest pain point? Oh, I recognize that I understand what that is and I know how to alleviate that. Yep. That's all. That's that's all you did, right? I mean, like, yep. but that's a lot. He was looking for a personal trainer because that's what he thought he needed. Right. Yep. And then you're like, hey, by the way, but what what are you looking for? What what problem are you trying to overcome? Well, right. I've got these athletes. I want to keep I want to make sure that they're, they're not injured and they have all these issues. And I'm not sure what it is. Right this way. I, I can exactly. help you. I'm the guy. I'm the Yoda in the story. I'm not the Luke Skywalker. I'm the Yoda in your story. Elliot, same question for you. Like origin story. Like, how'd you get involved? What what made you say, besides like obviously loving it, right? Because you got to do that, like you mentioned, like you wouldn't you wouldn't jump in the MLB unless you love that. Um, but how'd you take that leap? Because that's a big leap because this is the road. There wasn't a road when you guys were doing it. No. Well, actually, Matt kind of paved the road for me, but let me go back up just a little bit. So I've always really had an interest in kind of uh, chasing some of these niches. Um, I've been an athletic trainer since 2013, uh, working in traditional sports and specifically the performing arts. So that was really always my big passion because I grew up doing martial arts and stunt fighting and things like that. And I really always wanted to combine the movement rehab sciences with uh, the art of performing arts and martial arts and all of these things. Uh, worked for companies like Disney and Live Nation over my years as an athletic trainer. And then when I got into PT school, uh, I kind of got bored with the course curriculum and started playing a lot of Fortnite, like a lot of Fortnite. Um, and I picked up streaming as kind of um, a hobby. Uh, but I was really like, how can I combine my, my love of streaming with um, the physical therapy aspect of things. And that was originally why I got into it. But uh, my stream turned more into kind of a training ground for people to play the game. So there's kind of a map editing um, feature in Fortnite where you can kind of create your own custom scenarios and games and things like that where people can really use to refine their skills. So I was really focused on creating a lot of these maps that focused on a lot of these different skills that I was talking about earlier uh, for aim and like Fortnite's a game where you build structures and you shoot at the same time. So it kind of things that really challenged people and broke those skills down so they could really help development. Uh, I called it the scrim clinic. Um, so I started doing that. And then I found out about Matt at a um, an APTA Next conference. There was a whole presentation on uh, esports. And I was like super interested in that because that's when esports was really starting to get big. Uh, Fortnite was blowing up. Ninja, uh, Tifu, yeah. all of these like creators were really like starting to make their mark on the map and showing uh, just exactly how powerful um, esports was in the entertainment sphere. So I guess entertainment's really what I've always been interested in, um, no matter what shape or form that takes. Um, so I jumped on the train and I was like, I've been a gamer since I could stand up and I really want to combine this interest with my physical therapy practice. Um, and it's connected to Doc, man. That's exactly. Did. Exactly. That's so, I, so I noticed Matt was streaming on uh, Twitch and my first impression was of him was, damn, he's good at this. And so I reached out to him. I just had to stalk his Twitch chat for a little while, just keep sending him pings. And eventually, like he said that he was interested in doing a little collaboration. Um, he ended up bringing me in. He's been doing this a lot longer than I have. He's been in this space for the past five years. I've only been a PT for the past year. Um, so he brought me in, kind of showed me his philosophy on things, kind of got me up to speed. And eventually I made the, uh, the move to go out to LA and join him. And now we're working with some of the teams out here. We're making content all the time, uh, really expanding our partnerships with major corporations. Um, they want us to do pieces for them. Uh, developing curriculums for high schools, things like that. It's really taken off in a way that I never really expected it to. And I'm really happy it is. And I'm great. really happy to be able to blend all of my passions in entertainment and physical therapy. It's great. I mean, like I, I tell people success all the time, like has to do with the graphic on the screen. If you're watching was like, I gave a presentation when I was a student. And at that time, I think I was about to get a hundred thousand downloads for a podcast. And again, that was like 2015 when you had to literally first explain what a podcast was how to listen to it, why you should listen to it, what they were, like all that. And I literally said, I was giving a presentation to other students at the Virginia Physical Therapy Association, like Conclave or whatever. And I was like, listen, this is actually all I did. Like all I did was connect A to B. 
your A and my A were different, right? But like what we know from geometry, this is geometry, right? Yeah, geometry is yeah. there is a straight line between every two points, not a lot of points or some point, like every two points. And if you connect those things, if you're super passionate, and I, and I tell people all the time, correct me if I'm wrong, people listening, if you give a shit about something, like it's very difficult to stop you. Like if you really, really care, like knowledge and skill and talent, very important. But if you really care, di- like, like I would not want to compete against someone who really, really cared about something and just hated to lose. Like that person is deadly. That person will not quit. You might beat them today or tomorrow, but that person's going to get back up. And that's what you saw is you guys were just, you guys were driven for something. You're like, this is nice. I love this, but this isn't me. I want to find something else. And you just kept going until you found this. And now that you're here, it sounds like you kind of like it. Yeah, it's, I like it to the point that, you know, for the first three, four years of, of doing like this esports PC, PT stuff, there was nowhere near enough money in esports PT for it to be anything close to, you know, financially viable. It's like a full-time career. Mm-hmm. I spent the first three or four years subsidizing my esports PT career with my, you know, full-time hospital job. Yeah. There was one very memorable November where I worked my daily eight to four hospital job. Uh, Friday afternoon, I would fly out for a tournament. I would work Saturday, Sunday. Wow. I would red eye back for seven o'clock Monday morning. I did that for three weeks straight. Wow. It was rough. Yeah. I would never do that again. I don't think I would That's ever do that again. It was miserable, but it was worth it because yeah. it was one, it was where the need was. And two, it was where, you know, if, if I wanted to make this grow, that was what I needed to do. So it's what I did. To give a shit. Like I would not want to, again, not want to compete against someone who gives a shit about something because they're going to win. Like they're just like, there's only nine innings in a baseball game. But if someone who gives a shit is like, yeah, well, we're not playing a baseball game. We're playing the never ending baseball game where there's a million innings and I'm just going to keep playing until I win <laughs> the kid from big daddy. Right. What game are we playing? I win. How are the rules work? Well, I win. That's what it is. And the b- biggest success for me is a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed uh, we interviewed a guy who's a PT in Burlington, Vermont, who just works with Alpine athletes, right? Just skiers and snowboarders. I found him on, on Instagram. And I was like, hey, man, you, uh, hey man, you want to do an uh, episode? Like, I'm like, it's November. You know, let's, it's just before ski and snowboard season. Let's talk about this. And five, five minutes in the interview, I was like, how'd you decide this on this model? Like, how did you just say, hey, I'm just going to jump in and only treat these athletes by the way, he moved to Vermont from like Pennsylvania. He had never even lived in that community. He had no connections to it. He's just like, I like sneak skiing and snowboarding. I'm going to do this. And he literally said this podcast because I heard enough people come on here and go, I just di- I just heard people say, I want to do this and I want to connect these two dots. And they did. And he said, why not me? And I was like, that's exactly right. Why not you? If you, get, if you really care, if you really are driven to do it, who the hell is there to stop you? You have a license to practice physical therapy. I like to like equate it to like, you get a driver's license, guess what? You can go anywhere you want, like you know, <laughs> within reason, but not with, with, with your career. Like there is no reason. There's no limitation. If you can connect those random dots, like Caitlin said, five years ago, it wasn't a thing. And now it's a thing. And now, now it's, it's on the cover of like, how did that hit you when you guys were like, it's on the cover of the APT magazine. That was, um, it's still sinking in. I'm going to be honest. Like yeah. there's, there's so many things over the past year that have been I mean, for all of us that have been really thinking in like, so right now, um, you know, we're involved in writing some textbooks. We're involved in some research projects that are going to get like, we're aiming to get published in like JOSPT. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there have been conferences hosted by the NYIT Sports Performance Lab. um, And the APTA, our our organizing body as physical therapists, wrote a cover article in their like national magazine about esports physical therapy that one blows my mind two is really freaking cool uh and three still doesn't almost like seem like it's real but at the same time it's there's some degree of just finally i'm glad other people are noticing that this thing is really cool and really interesting and wanting to be involved too there's not any you know it's not any sense of gatekeeping i don't want to keep any pts out of this i want anybody who is capable of providing something that's valuable to this community to be in it if There's you've got something unique exactly. and necessary and skillful and valuable to provide, get in here. We need you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We see. need all the help we can get. You <laughs> seriously do. There's a lot of athletes out there. Like uh, that's what I mean. Early on in my in my podcast career, like right when I like you know a year in when I was having like pretty decent success, right? People were like, "Are you like like a lot of people are starting podcasts now? Are you like intimidated?" Somebody asked me, like, uh, uh, "Is there any competition for you as a as a podcaster?" 
And this was a student, so I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna here, I'm gonna make a dramatic effect, right? Is there any po- are you, like, is there any con- uh, competition for you as a podcast? And I was like, no. And I like pause for like dramatic effect because I'm like, here's the deal. For me, podcasting is like swimming. It's like we might be doing the same thing, but we're in our own lanes. Like, and like, hey man, like I don't, I don't get any extra points if you drown. Like that doesn't, that's not how it works. And the fact that there are more podcasters now than there were five years ago actually just gives more credence to the medium, which again is just spoken word, but people having conversations, right? So like you guys seeing other people have success, I'm, I'd love to hear you hear that or hear you say that because that just says this is a thing. And yeah. please come in because these athletes, these people we want to take care of, deserve it. It's it gamers aren't it going is. anywhere. Yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, they are. Especially not during a pandemic. Exactly. <laughs> they're all gamers now. They are, they are going somewhere. The answer is up. They're, they're, I mean, like, exactly. right. I started playing. There's going to be no shortage of patients in the future. That's no. sure. right. Right. And the other thing too is, like, there's there. You know, the the more PTs we getting we get coming from their own diverse backgrounds, whatever experiences they have that shape them as as a PT and as a person the more likely it is that we're going to be able to draw from their knowledge and create something better than what exists presently in the analog of traditional sports. That's it. Right. So I guess it's a sport, huh? I mean, it's on the cover of APT magazine. I guess we just stop and be like, listen guys, it's in J O S P T. So I don't know. <laughs> we settled it. That's yeah. all there is to it. It's we'll official. Get, we'll get it in there. Um, anything I didn't ask, anything you guys would want to mention about like, what, you know, I mean, specifically for this audience with PTs, PTAs, um, anything we want to know, resource you'd want to kick them to? Um, let's see. I mean, I, I guess I I did want to add one thing that's kind of interesting, that's unique to esports, in that one thing people have to consider when we're working with this population is everything obviously that came mentioned in that there's this lack of infrastructure um but also that there's so many different cultures that we have to consider when working with this population there are teams and professional teams that bring together multiple cultures from Fran- from France or from Korea from China and they're all brought together on this one professional team to and have to learn how to communicate and work with each other and in that situation, it's it's not really, I mean, I guess it's common in some of the other sports, but you have to listen and really take the time and care enough to learn about their cultures and their own respective beliefs within their culture so that you can best serve them. Yeah. A lot of the times, as everyone mentioned, we try to to place this existing framework of traditional sports onto esports without truly bridging the gap or identifying where they are and that's always the first step. We just need to listen. We just need to identify where they are in, uh, I guess, with everything and and then make the best decision on how we can move forward with them. Yeah, where they're on their personal, you know, journey, where they are, you know, it, it, the micro and the macro. Like, where are you in life? Like, you know, Caitlin talking about red-eyeing it for three weeks. I'm, you know, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure like that. that's something I wouldn't have known that that was a thing to go to those tournaments on that kind of cadence. But you got to understand what that what that person sitting across from you, whether that's in person or virtually, if you're treating them, uh, is going through. And that is, uh, you know, the first step, the second step, the most important step, right? Which is that listening. Uh, the other the other thing for me, I think um, that I'd I'd love to add on here is, I think one of the biggest kind of growth points for esports and potentially for esports PTs is in schools. Uh, more yeah. and more high schools and colleges are having both club and varsity esports programs we're in a really unique position to be able to help support the growth of those programs as well. And I think we're, we're also in a really great position where um, we've talked about going from the top down, right? We've also talked about going from the bottom up, that is changing the kind of cultural understanding broadly in the gaming community about what it means to compete at a high level and what it takes to get there. And if we can start baking that into the collective consciousness from you know a middle school or high school age, like esport competitor level, then we're going to see in the long term so much more success for these players um, and so much more growth for the industry and so much more sustainability in the sense that people aren't going to be having to retire due to injury at you know 24 or 28 when they could absolutely have made it farther if all along they kind of baked in these very important, very basic um, structures for how to take care of themselves or if we've been there all along to be able to help them do that. Yeah, yeah, the good information. I mean, you know, Kate, you, you, you had mentioned it several times 
not enough research specifically on esports. So you're like, well, if there isn't specific research on esports, I'll just borrow from things that are similar. Great for the short term, right? Which is, hey, this is what we know on air traffic controllers. This is what we know from chess players. This is what we know from other athletes. We need more specific stuff, but hey, these are the demands that are being put on these individuals. So we should pay attention to those. Yeah. Uh, are you guys ready to play three questions? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do three questions. <laughs> No pressure. Three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing, leaders in hashtag travel PT. Find them online at AURESmedical.com. Positions in all 50 states and all settings. Uh, we're going to go clockwise, but we'll start with Kate. There we go. Over there. Um, we're going to go with first is a where question. Kate where, where, Kate, where are you living right now? I am about halfway between D.C. and Baltimore. Oh, okay. And these you guys are both in like the L.A. area or something, not west with the fair yeah, yeah. weather in, in L.A. Sun. I haven't seen in a couple weeks. Great. All right. So first question is a where qu question. We'll go Caitlin, Matthew, Elliot. Uh, where's somewhere you want to go once like COVID is like gone? Rearview mirror. Where are you going to go? Where's the first place that you, you travel to? All right. It's going to sound really silly, but I want to go to New Jersey. Okay. Because do you know how long it's been since I've been able to get good pizza? Oh, well, keep going. I mean, if you're in New Jersey, just go to New York. That's where the good pizza is kept. Matthew. Excuse you. <laughs> There is perfectly good pizza in New Jersey. Good. I am from New Jersey and I will fight you. 74th and Amsterdam is great pizza. Keep going. Matt, <laughs> you got? I think I'd probably want to unplug and head out over to Hawaii. You know, oh, kind yeah. of enjoy. Enjoy the, the nice weather. Yeah. The nice That's weather. Fun. You're in LA. What do you <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm in New York right now. All right. Uh, Elliot, what do you got? Where are you going to go once COVID is in the rear view? Yo, I'm trying to go scuba diving in the Keys. There you That's, go. That's where I'm Ooh. going. I saw that in your profile, scuba diver. I was actually in Grenada when the COVID, when the COVID, when the COVID hit. When the COVID, COVID. The COVID. But I was in like the underground. Have you ever seen that thing? Like the underground, like um, sculpture garden in Grenada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, I we was have a lot of those. Day before COVID, the COVID hit the the states. Anyway, uh, second you question. Stayed there. What's that? <laughs> so you should have stayed there. Should have. I was quarantined there. I'd be like, bummer. It's cheaper to live here than it was in Manhattan. Exactly. So let's just stay. Uh, second question on three questions is a what question. So what's something you've watched, read, or listened to? Book, movie, podcast, or something that you think the audience would get value from? Hmm. That the audience would get value from. It could be like, could be super like, that's why I always leave it open-ended. Like, could be like something specific about what you do, or it's just, hey, this is something... Like someone the other day said, uh, Queen's Gambit. That was their answer. Understandably. I'm like, I'm glancing over at my bookshelf right now, which is horribly it's disorganized. Black. And I have the classic, I have the classic bookshelf problem of, I have an insufficient amount of bookshelf for my quantity of books. Um, the one I've really been loving recently, actually, uh, it's uh, it's called Unweaving the Rainbow. Okay. Um, it's not super new. Um, it is an older book, but it's, it's very much about how and a greater understanding of the world and how it works does not diminish our capacity for awe or joy or delight in it. Um, a thing being mysterious is not the only way a thing can be delightful and awesome. Um, so it's very much about, you know, how science can in fact make the world around us even more awesome as we understand it. I love it. All right, Matthew, what do you got for your what? Um, I guess same, something similar. I've been reading because I'm actually going to be a father, but I've been reading hey, this book. Hey. Called, That's awesome. Yay! The That's whole gonna be a child. dad. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, a girl dad. So I'm excited. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But I've been reading this book that's neuroscience based called The Whole Brain Child, and really it's just the neuroscience approach on how to handle the various uh, situations that might arise when you are raising a child and how to handle these, uh, I guess, different aspects of stress and considering neuroscience principles. And it's just been an eye opening in the sense that everyone, if you just think about it, everyone's still a kid at heart and all these principles that you consider uh, to be able to handle these situations can be applied everywhere and in all possible situations, especially with the patients that we work with, um, <laughs> really just being able to listen, understand the emotional intelligence, uh, totally. uh, interviewing, uh, mo motivational interviewing so that we can help them uh, establish or progress their beliefs about certain things. And uh, that's just been fun for me to, to really see the connection between, I guess, handling situations with kids and adolescence and then how that might even transition over to the adolescence that game. So, yeah, 
I, uh, I had a conversation today. I was working on a, uh, a study with someone and they were like, um, you moved from outpatient orthopedics, like kind of high end cash based uh, PT to pediatrics. Why did you do that? And I was like, uh, the kids in pediatrics uh, complain less than the adults. So that's why I, that's why I, trans- that's why I transit. Yes. It's true. Yes. Kids are just excited to play games. Uh, Elliot, what do you got for your what? Uh, I recently have been reading a lot of like entrepreneurial kind of books because I just yeah. launched my own business, my own side business, yeah. uh, which I'm pretty excited about. But uh, Think and Grow Rich was the book that I read last that really kind of s- struck a chord with me and really gave me a lot of motivation for kind of pushing myself to the limit and really visualizing what I want and setting appropriate goals and making making my dreams a reality in a lot of ways. Yeah. Smart to listen to people who are smart. I don't know. Sounds like a good game plan. Uh, last thing, we, we like to start now with people. Uh, who is someone the audience should know more about? I purposefully leave this open-ended. Uh, it could be PT-related or not. I just like to say, who should the audience know more about? Hmm. If somebody else wants to steal first, I'm going to have to think for mm, a second. Yeah, I want to think. I want to take some time. <laughs> there's a lot I'd like, of people to, uh, I'd like to shout out. One of my former mentors, uh, Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffrey Russell, he's an athletic trainer out of Ohio University, and he does a lot of work in the performing arts space uh, for uh, injury prevention, concussion research, a lot of things like that, and just a really uh, thought leader in the space that I really have admired for a long time. Now you talk performing arts and I remember being in PT school thinking like, well, that's so niche. Like that's the, you know, how is that going to help? And I'm like, that's exactly how it helps. It's like when you, you know, from the movie, the Patriot, right? You aim small, miss small. It's like, I don't like, why would you aim at esports? It's so small and narrow. It's like, yeah, but in that world, it's a big deal. Why would you have a podcast about physical therapy? It's like, cause to the physical therapy people, the world, that's a big, that's their world. So it's like 15 years ago, Niche didn't make any sense. And now that's the world is based on niche. I mean, the world is based and sorted by hashtags. Right, Find dude. a niche and dive into it. Yep. Motto. Are you guys enough time? To think of someone? Yeah, I, I thought of someone good. Actually, I thought of two people good, but I'm going to go with the, the first one who came to mind. Uh, Daniel Bonner. Uh, he is a clinical psychologist. He also does really great research on sleep, which is super duper applicable in esports. Um, he's actually got some, some publications already out and a couple that will be coming out soon. Listening to him talk about sleep and how it works and why it works and why it's necessary is like really helpful for me in my practice. Um, I love learning from folks. Matt, did I just steal yours? That's so funny. Yeah, because, <laughs> you have to double up. because I had just had a conversation with him about and with a, a pro athlete, a pro esports athlete, about how they can optimize their sleep. And then he yep. was referencing a lot of the things that they found in their studies. And I guess one of the more interesting things was the average sleep time for a professional esports athlete. Why don't you guys guess? What do you guys think the average sleep time is? Five? Four and a half. I'll give you the specific. 3.11 p.m. Oh, wait, wait, wait. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. 3.11 a.m. a.m. they go to sleep? Yeah, they go to sleep. That's the average time that they go to sleep. And what is dictating that is often, depending on the eSport, when they're playing, when the the professional players are scrimming, when they're competitively playing, for instance, in League of Legends, they might play at 10 to 12 and and then two to four. But Fortnite people, they play from five to eight. And wow. all of that influences the, the schedule of when they might be sleeping. Right. And obviously, we know how important sleep is, Big how it yeah. affects our rhythms, yeah. our body clocks. So that's so funny because I, I wanted to, to shout out him as well because he is a great person to know, really knows his stuff about sleep. And Double we've been shout. working together on some stuff. So, yeah, oh, so clearly shout out. definitely listened to Dave huh? Money. All right. Uh, last thing we do on the show, we call it the parting shot. Let's do the parting shot right now. Party shot brought to you by our friends from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. Uh, independent study courses. Uh, I. SCs, as they call them. I had to play that one out in my head. Uh, like uh, or, uh, current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy. If you're thinking about taking that OCS exam, yeah, want to get a prep course to ramp up for that? Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. It's in the name, people. The Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online again at orthopt.org. All right, parting shot. Kate, you've done this before, so we'll let you go first. Kind of your mic drop moment, whatever you'd want to leave with the audience uh, for tonight as people go forth and we wrap this episode up. Uh, Caitlin, what's your parting shot? Uh, if I could leave people with one single parting shot, it's uh, 
don't just get yourself pigeonholed into learning kind of in the traditional models of whatever it is you're studying. Um, if you're not seeking out information from sources that don't necessarily just fit into your traditional structure, you're missing out on so much information. Um, you absolutely, regardless of whether you work in esports or not, drawing from a whole bunch of different industries is only going to make you a better clinician and only going to make you a more well-rounded person in the end. Yeah, it's definitely going to do that. Matthew, what do you got? Your parting shot. What do you want to leave with the audience tonight? Mm, I mean, I think we touched a little bit about this already, but really just show that you care. I mean, I think the number one thing if you're trying to work in this industry is you need to care about the athletes that you're working with. You need to take the time to listen uh, about their story and not try to um, apply your own framework of how you view the world on them. So, yeah, really just listen and, and care for the, the people that you work with. Yeah, sounds pretty sounds pretty basic, which we know is the, the root of all that's good, right? Uh, Elliot, wrap it up for us with your parting shot. Yo, just don't be afraid to break out of that uh, nine to five outpatient ortho model. Um, really explore what you're into. Really explore how what you can offer as a PT is valuable to that population. Um, literally, physical therapy is useful for everybody. So there's not a single person on this planet that moves that is unable to benefit from what we do. So no matter what you love, there's an application for PT. And I would just encourage more people to start looking into those applications and seeing how they can make a productive monetization structure out of it and elevate the profession as a whole. Because every time you dive into one of these niches, it elevates all of us. Connect yep. two dots, connect two dots, just connect two dots, T connect two things you love, whatever you love and everything, right? So you found those two things. Connect those. Uh, we want to make sure we get people the uh, the website. People want to find out and reach you guys. Uh, we'll put it on the screen. The website is one-hp.org. Yep. The hyphen's important. You go nowhere without the hyphen. One yeah. hyphen. Yeah. That's one hit point. It yeah. is. Right. I want to make one sure. health only. You only have one health one health uh lady and gentlemen i want to say thanks for doing this it was on the cover of the apta magazine which means you got, we got to have you back on in, in in not too long right we got to have you, you back on soon um mm -hmm. uh, i wish you guys all the best i appreciate your time and kudos for you guys for digging in and saying i love this and i'm gonna do it damn it we're yeah, glad to be here thank you for having us jimmy have a great thank night you so much jimmy